It just right. wasted. Okay, here we go. Thanks everybody for joining us today. We have a very fun topic. I'm going to start first with some announcements. Uh, just a reminder that we are doing Summer Academy virtually this year over a series of Zoom meetings um, starting next Thursday, June 4th. We sent out the registration for that, so please be sure to register. Um, we want to see you guys there. We're covering some really important topics um, that have to do with a paradigm shift, a database coming out, a new manual, all sorts of really exciting things. So. Uh, we look forward to seeing you guys there. And um, there aren't really any other announcements, I don't think. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce. First of all, I want to thank Naomi Bledsoe. I don't know if Naomi's on here from Reynolds uh, High School Transition Specialist. She connected me with our guest speaker today, Kay Dunn, um, to cover just some really relevant, exciting, fun uh, topics today, basically about virtual networking. Um, resumes, updates, updated practices for resume writing, and then also uh, virtual interviewing. So extremely relevant. When she and I touched base, I just got really excited thinking, gosh, this could be like a whole entire summer curriculum, you know, or for, for those of us who are looking for things to do. So just, I'm tickled to have you here. Um, and Kay, you can take it away. Well, hi, thank you for that great introduction. Um, I am a trainer for workforce operations for WorkSource Oregon. And today I'm gonna to go over a bite of what we have or what we offer in workshops for our job seekers. Particularly what we have is um, networking and resume as well as virtual workshops. And my clicker today has decided it doesn't wanna work for me. So a slice of networking. So what exactly is networking? Networking is anything that you can do in discussing with a person that you know about your career. You may not talk to your garbage man about your career, but you may talk to somebody at the grocery store if you're interested in retail management. So depending on what your career choice is really depends on who your network is. One of the most important networks that we have to utilize today is going to be our virtual network. Our virtual network can be utilized even when we're in lockdown, so it's something to make sure you're connecting with. Networking basics on and offline. When you're online for networking, you want to make sure that you follow basic etiquette. will go over in a minute. When you're offline, you also want to make sure you're following basic etiquette. The very number one thing you don't want to do in networking is, hey, so um, I'm looking for a job. You don't want to introduce yourself as looking for a job because if you do, then people know that you're just hunting for something. Whereas if you say something like, Wow, I just graduated with my archaeology degree. Can you believe it? I have all of these skills and now I don't even know what to do. That's more likely to engage somebody in a conversation than asking them for that job, even if you're desperate for a job. And right now with almost 15% of Oregon on unemployment, it's really, really important that we don't just say, hey, I want something, which is something that you'll see trend with all forms of job hunting. So the first thing about networking is your networking tips for etiquette. And I have that just a second. You need to know who your network is. That means if your network is all academics, then you wanna make sure that you have a good relationship with anybody who is teaching in a specific topic that you're teaching. And it is a, it's my understanding that the majority of you come from some type of educational background or human services background. So you're also going to wanna to network with anyone who can trans, for your skills. So if you have something, say a connection with DHS or a connection, some of Wolf Creek Job Corps, it's a good idea to be able to connect with those individuals as your network. You want to make sure that if you say you're going to follow up with your network on something, you follow up because if you don't follow up, then you've actually just damaged a relationship while you're networking. You want to leverage your social media. Leveraging your social media means that you should seek out businesses and contacts that you are commenting on their pages, but you don't want to just comment to anybody who works at a job. You want to narrow your target to either HR directors or somebody in the department that you want to work for, because then you're building a connection that's really vital and the boss will listen to, or the hiring manager will listen to. And of course, I did really well with My fake pros, I am so sorry. My technical glitches still occur to this day. We are used to it. <laughs> okay. So th those are basic networking tips. 
one thing that you want to do if you you're like i really want to ask about what the job is like that's good you want to ask questions when you're networking when you're asking make sure you say things like so what is a day in your life like things that you would use in an interview for asking a question so when you're talking to somebody that you work with or work at the company or a similar company you want to make sure you're engaging in what is the company culture like so when you can walk into an interview you will know answers before they're even asked let other people do the talking so you definitely don't want to be the only one talking and that's i'm going to open the floor up right now if you have a question shout it out at me during this entire presentation if you have something you're like hey that doesn't make sense could you explain them on that explain that or expand on that a little more please just let me know Remember to have an online presence for networking, even if you're probably going to do more in-person networking because hiring managers, which are 90% of hiring managers are online and LinkedIn right now, 57% of those hiring managers will not hire someone if they have no social media whatsoever or any form of online presence. They're called a ghost. And if you're a ghost, hiring managers don't trust you. Your elevator speech. Not sure many of you are using elevator speeches right now. And I see there's, um, it looks like a question and I'm not sure. The box just came down and told me there might be a chat question, so. Yeah, it's, um, I often tie in my work values when I ask about a position. For example, I ask about if they feel good about the teamwork at a place. Yes, that's, that's really important. That's one of the, the topics that we wanna cover. Um, I don't think I have the slide for this this short version, but teamwork or what your motivators are for working at, an in, at a certain environment or certain job is very important as well. You could have an accounting job and a, an accounting position that covers everything in terms of your you. needs for a job, but I'm they don't meeting. have the culture that you need. So you want to make sure that you are attending what are advance, your principles. I'm in, a, I'm in a statewide meeting, which means somebody is not um, muted. Hang on here. Okay, try again there. <laughs> so elevator speeches are 30 to 60 second speeches that you give for yourself. One that's absolutely fabulous and I love is um, a Leslie Ormandy from Clackamas Community College. We were working on her CV and she said, I don't know what, how to brand myself. LinkedIn requires a brand or a statement or a profile statement. You wanna have something very short within 10 to 12 words max. What we did for her is I raise pros from the dead. Now that seems ludicrous for a branding statement for a lot of people, but Leslie is a teacher who instructs students in historical writing to include Vlad the Impaler. And she writes vampire novels, so it really fits her persona. So when she uses her, her introduction captures a person like, wait, what are you talking about? Very similar to what my husband's brand would be in computing is, He's a computer doctor. He does hardware, software, he works on databases, he knows all about it. So his catchphrase instead of I'm a doctor is I'm a computer doctor. Why? Because it brands him for doing something in a specific field that's very catchy and we memorize it. Over branding page, so that was our branding. I'm really bad at flipping pages while I'm talking, I apologize. So with this, we're gonna do a quick little game if that's okay, I might skip a few because we may not have time for all of them, but branding is something that we all pay attention to. So if I was to say the most magical place on earth, what would your answer be? Go ahead, shout it out. I wanna hear it. Disneyland. That's right. So Disneyland is the answer. Anywhere but. <laughs> if I. Oregon coast. Great. <laughs> But for a branding statement, Disneyland took that and people love it. It gives them a sense of home, a sense of meaning, and it captures who they are. They, they try to take on different worlds and offer everything to everyone. So it's even though toddlers throw more temper tantrums there, I think, than anywhere in the world, it's considered the happiest place on earth. So if I said, give me a break, give me a break, break me off a piece of that. Kit Kat bar. That's right. It's a Kit Kat bar. Or how about I'm loving it? That's a harder one. Da, 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 da. No, it might be the wrong one. My job. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. It's McDonald's. So 
another thing, um, and I think I'll probably cruise by some of these, is $5, $5. Subway, foot long. That's right, it's Subway. So some of these other things are. Um, okay. Can you hear me now? I had a, yes. I had a yes. question with, um, was that um, from Alexis, was that 10 to 12 words or sentences to capture the persona? 10 to 12 words on your branding statement, your elevator speech should be 30 to 60 seconds. So what, wh how you speak, you should probably slow down. I'm a speed talker. So I have to slow down even when I'm in these events and I know I'm just going, going, going because I want to squeeze everything in all at once and sometimes I just can't. So 30 to 60 seconds for your elevator speech and 10 to 12 words for your branding statement. So can you hear me now is Verizon and people recognize that. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Snap, cr snap crackle, pop is Rice Krispie. And some of these, I'm gonna just, this one, can anybody tell me this catchphrase or branding statement? I'll give you, it's Alka-Seltzer. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what relief it is. That's right, great. See? I'm showing my age, I'm sure. That's an old well, one. You know what? I asked everybody in my household and my 13-year-old daughter was like, that stuff that you stick in water and it fizzes. Hmm. And she's, we've never had it in our house before. And I said, yes. And she's like, it's like Alka-Seltzer or something. I said, yep, that's it. And my husband's just like, oh, okay. I, I never knew that. That's funny. And then Skittles taste the rainbow. Stuck on Band-Aid because Band-Aid stuck on me. So as you can tell, brands stick with us. It doesn't matter if we memorize all the brands that are there, brands really do resonate with us. So having a brand resonate from your networking to your resume, all the way to the question asked of tell us about yourself, sticking with those 10 to 12 words just to introduce that statement on everything from your elevator speech to your summary profile on your resume to the tell me about yourself, helps employers connect you. And the more they can connect you, the more they'll remember you. You know, I have to say, I love that you're talking about this because that tell me about yourself question's got to be the hardest one on the interview for many students, maybe even for myself. I think so too. I hear a lot of people who answer like, I'm a mom, I, or something that they've done in their personal life rather than what they've done in their career. And you really want to um, guide people to answer that based on what they do with lives for their career rather than their family lives. I know some people answers that she's a ballerina, but she she's applying for several arts. It's web page design, but because she can talk about choreography in ballet, she can talk about choreographing a web page as well, and it comes out just beautifully. Mm -hmm. So the hidden job market market is really quick and. Um, percent of our job market is hidden. That means that most employers don't ever post it. They're looking for people they can trust. Who do they trust? Their workers and their employees and their family connections. So you want to make sure if you have a, a place you want to work, you know someone in that business or someone related to somebody in that business because they're going to first search for those people in their network. And you want to find a way to connect with them in their network, even if it's not directly with them. Social media and networking, if you have a chance, this is a, a one minute and 44 second video. I'm not gonna play it today, uh, but it does tell about branding and networking and the importance of locking down your web pages and things that may not um, fit in this particular situation, but it's something you can email out to your students and or whomever you're working with, and it will remind them in a really fast way in a bite-sized chunk that probably would be easier for them to digest than an hour-long workshop. So, the more things are, employers are all online. We aren't necessarily looking for ways to hire people. Employers, more than 60% of employers look at your LinkedIn account, not to hire you, but to look at a way to not hire you. So you wanna make sure that your LinkedIn accounts, your Facebook accounts, Twitters, blogs, whatever your online presence is, it's either locked down securely or you have a personal site that does not have your picture on it and a professional site that does have your picture on it. 
so that the employer, when they scan by your name, if it's a picture that doesn't look like you from your professional world, they won't look into it. Because if you have politics or hot button issues that you discuss on your Facebook or your Twitter, it's very likely that an employer won't hire you if they see that you're very opinionated on a subject because that can cause issues within their own business with employer or employees in the same company. 79% of employers look on your LinkedIn profile. So if you're not on LinkedIn, get on LinkedIn immediately. LinkedIn may not be easy to keep up. It's not something we necessarily like to do, but it allows us a brand. It allows us to put our resume and it also allows us to connect with people via a social networking environment. 26% of employers will look at your Facebook, 14% at Twitter, and 14% at your personal blogs. So there are specific times to be on the, these networks as well for employers. Employers like to be on Facebook from 1 to 4, on Twitter from 1 to 3, on LinkedIn from 7 a.m. and 9 to 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. LinkedIn really focuses on being off the uh, employers off of the online spectrum during the working hours. They want to put a precedence out there that the nine to five job is really you're supposed to be on your job rather than your social media. So they try to keep posting jobs and things with large, especially 500, Fortune 500 companies at these times. Your Google Plus is 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. People tend to check these in the morning. They also tend to be on right about lunchtime when they wanna see if there are any new comments or posts. This is the best time to connect with employers as well. So if somebody has a specific employer they want to seek and message, this is the time to be there. And I did send these slides to Michelle, so I think she can send them. Pinterest, a lot of people say right, Pinterest. Um, because there was a question, um, Kay, with um, putting the times in. Um, this will be on our on the resources page on the YTP website afterward. Thank you. So Pam, if you can get that there, that'd be great. Does that work? Where's Pam? So Thanks. Pinterest is something that employers use. In fact, if you're looking for connecting with an employer, you can see their interests on Pinterest. You can also look at infographics that they put up and post, and that'll give you an idea of who they are as a as an employer. It'll give you ideas on their culture and you can cross share things that of interest and say, hey, when you have to have a follow up for networking and I say have to have because I'm one of those people who hate to follow up. So I understand that, but follow up should always be done 24 to 48 hours after you promise something and Pinterest is a way to help with that follow up. Yeah. Remember that Twitter is jobs to promote attendance at events, to promote very quick information bites uh, and advertise special events and things that are coming up. Facebook is, its specialty is being able to talk and communicate with employers, share your experience had with that employer that are positive or that employer's product. LinkedIn is for building trustworthiness with key people. And that is really where you wanna be if you're looking to break into a specific employer. YouTube is your infomercial space. And in a virtual environment that we're all starting to live in, and it's, it's our new shift in reality, we're going to be using more and more virtual spaces. And YouTube is where we're likely going to see a pickup in resumes. Instead of paper copy resumes, we're going to see people sending in videos to show what their online presence is going to be like. So can they look at a camera? Can they smile? Can, can they nod and uh, give verbal and nonverbal communication cues? I'm slow on the draw and pushing these buttons, I'm sorry. So basic rules, presence do's and don'ts and presence, or presence don'ts, I'm sorry. So you wanna make sure you're always polite no matter what, even if you're, you're not the one that's late for a meeting or you're not the one having technology, it's okay to say, I'm sorry this happened. You wanna make sure you're always being polite. Same thing in a real interview, when you're really networking with real ind individuals, you wanna also be genuine. So some of these rules like, a background that's plain and organized. You'll, oh yeah, see, that's my real background. It's a blue wall, but you can't see it because I didn't move my hand fast enough. So you want to make sure that your presence um, represents who you are. You don't want to try to fake being something that you're not. If you typically have pink wild hair, don't change that for the interview because you don't know if your trial service will end because you've changed something about yourself. 
always be genuine. So some of these um, take well, with a grain of salt. Yes. Sorry, Kay. I just no I wanted to go back to thanks, Jesse, for putting for putting those in quick um, about TikTok, and I know that goes back to what you had before. Um, Francis is noticing that it's um, rising as a product aid. It Have is. Have you gotten much experience with that, or? I, uh, I want my personal opinion on TikTok. I hate TikTok uh, just because I think it's used too frequently to hurt people, especially in the younger generation. But for jobs and services, TikTok can be used not only to find people who have a great enthusiasm and a talent in certain certain things, whether it be their artistry or even their um their flexibility, they do gymnastics, they do all kinds of things that they can showcase in just little 10 to 30 second blips. Uh, it really helps the employer see what that person's like. What are they promoting? So if somebody is constantly promoting where somebody is falling on their face or somebody is getting hurt, that employer knows that that person may not have the compassion that they want to see or that empathy that they want to see. So yes, they are starting to check TikTok. They're more likely to check TikTok on somebody who's under the age of 25 than people who are over the age of 25. And that's because the users that are over 25 are less likely to be adding to TikTok. They're more likely to just be viewing TikTok. So that's, you want to make sure if you are viewing TikTok, and I don't know if anybody has TikTok or not, but if you are viewing TikTok, make sure you clear your history and you don't hit a lot of likes of things that are negative or that you're, when you're seeing people fall over or you're sick and hungover that's something that you don't tick tock you can laugh at it that's fine just don't like it and and bring down your online presence and reputation interesting yeah and francis says yeah she hasn't used it but it might it may be a, de a deterrent yes um, i think i lock it down on all my kids cell phones so oh okay so you want to make sure that you are, and while networking, always helping your non-competitor. I'm just going to jump in here because I, I, I want to make sure I get to all of this. I'm really sorry. I might have put too much in here. You want to make sure you're helping all your non-competitors. You can help your competitors in jobs too. If they want to apply for a position somewhere you're not applying, go ahead and give them a tip because that might help you get them off of the interview list or the interested list of a job you're applying for, and it might help them as well, which will resonate with them for a long time. And when you need something in the future, it's very likely that they will return, excuse me, return that favor. So your online presence do's and don'ts, always maintain. Um, oh, I just wanted to put something in here that Pam put. Um, there are laws in place now that you are not required to share social media with employers, at least in Oregon, right? Obviously, no. if leave it public, they can use it. So um, something my, my boss said when um, she, she was hiring a new person that just is coming on next week, I believe. She said something like, so when I was at my last job that wasn't a state job, I looked up everyone on their social media. And she said, some of you are a little political. So I'm pretty sure she was speaking directly to me. But because she, she winked into her camera, which generally means that she's saying she saw something. I open up my social media so that people can see what I have to say after I've landed a job and I've passed my, temp or my temporary or trial services. So I know my boss is constantly checking our social media, even though they're supposed to use that for a, a hiring decision. It's just like ageism or anything else. Um, they're not supposed to does not mean they're not. A state entity, like a state government entity, cannot check social media. They're not, or the HR directors tell the managers, you cannot do this. You cannot make this hiring decision based on social media. That doesn't mean that if you have a profile out there, they don't just Google your name and check out who you are. So if you have social media, you want to lock it down unless it's something that's appropriate across all platforms. Yes, it is true that we're not supposed to be using it, no. but if you can find information that put somebody in a positive light or put somebody in a negative light, are you going to use that regardless of the law? So if you found out that there was someone who had um, a history of child abuse and yeah, it's illegal to post reports, but somebody had posted that, that report online, you wouldn't hire them even if it was buried in um, background checks and it was past seven years. So it wouldn't come up on the Oregon check anyway. I know some child, child abuses do, but some neglect cases don't necessarily come up with DHS after seven years. So you want to make sure that people are hiding these things anyway, because 
so, and I, I hate to use the word hiding, they're removing it from the view of employers so that mm -hmm. decisions are made based on who they are now, their character now, rather than who they are in their offline presence. For example, I'm a very emotional person with my family. However, when it comes to work, I'm here to work and everybody better be here to work too. So that somebody might go on and see that I had something about how wonderful my son is online and think, oh, she's, she's too, too, too emotional. So that's something I would lock down on my page. That's just an example. And I think a really good example, I know when I was a transition specialist with every student, I sat down and said, let's see what's on Facebook. Let's see what happens when you Google your name. And kids are kind of shocked when they when they're like, oh my gosh, and it's like, okay. And we'll get into more of that when we talk about why I go by K. <laughs> I promise. So you want to make sure that you're always maintaining a presence and connecting by building relationships with people. You want to help others, whether or not you need help right now. You always follow up within 48 hours, preferably 24 hours, just like you would in an interview. You want to add your LinkedIn connections regardless of their status. What I mean by that is if somebody is a subordinate and you're a CEO, you still want to add them regardless of what their position is because you never know who they might be an administrative assistant for or who they might have in their connection that would really help you. You also want to make sure that anytime you can meet in person with your virtual network, you do that. So if you have a virtual network of I, I, um, I'm a kind of science fiction nerd. So if I can meet with the people who like science fiction, then that can expand my network and we're more likely to have real connection because of that in-person meeting. Virtual space, yes, we can meet, we can see each other, we can smile, but it's a quicker interaction than an in-person meeting would be. Don't only connect to make requests. Don't just expect others to help you. Never appear on boards only when you need something. That is something a lot of people do, especially introverts. So if you have an introverted um, student or client that you're working with, you wanna make sure you encourage them that this online network, this is the easy part because you're not actually having to go anywhere. You can spend your time answering questions about your favorite topics rather than having a small talk conversation about who the best actor in Hollywood is which may not be something that they're interested in. And you definitely never reject someone based on their title or status on LinkedIn and you don't, re don't ignore requests. It is okay to ignore something if you feel it's for identity theft or it's from a different country and you're worried about that, that's okay to ignore. But if it's somebody who's in the same um, niche of careers that you're in, you wanna go ahead and add them to your network unless you want to keep your network locked down to just people that you know so that you can tell employers, I know this person very intimately. Um, most people don't do that. It can help in some situations, but generally that's in much higher level um, CEO, FEO positions. We're gonna go ahead and transition to a bite of resumes and I'll probably speed through this. I do apologize. Resumes are used for a marketing tool as well as to highlight skills, examples of your work, and it gets you that interview. By marketing, you're going to use your same branding that you used on your elevator speech and your profiles online. A resume is not meant to be a treasure hunt. It takes an HR director anywhere from 6 to 10 seconds with 7.4 seconds being the average time they scan your resume. And that resume is in a time period that it's already passed what is called the ATS tracking system. An ATS or automatic tracking system, also known as an applicant tracking system when it's just utilized for resumes. That system scans whatever is in a job description. The job description has very specific words. If you see on the job description, it says developed curriculum and on your resume, you said created curriculum, you only get points for the word curriculum, you don't get the points for created. Even though design and created can be mean the same thing and humanize, the computer AI system doesn't see it that way. Same thing if a job said looking for a waitress or a waiter and you said a server because it's more politically correct, then your, your resume is going to be pushed to the side. With education, if a job says a high school diploma, GED or above, and you put an associate's degree or a doctorate on that resume and you don't address the GED or the high school diploma, it's very likely that you're not going to pass the ATS system. 
when it asks for education, education typically takes up anywhere from five to 15%. ATS systems are set to accept resumes to send to an HR director or a talent scout that are at least 85% matches. Generally, it's closer to 95% for entities where they get receive more than 1,000 applicants. Employers who have more than 50 people tend to receive anywhere from 500 to 1,000 applicants within the first couple of weeks. So when you're looking at these jobs, they on, they're only going to interview 10 to 15 people. So do you, do you expect the person who you're putting their resume in or you're helping them with the resume to get an interview um, and you're using the job description words or are people not getting an interview, they seem like a perfect match and maybe their words aren't matching. That's something to consider. Also with the treasure hunt and HR directors, with ATS systems as well as HR directors, they like to see a very standard name on the top of the resume or at the side of the resume and then you want to have either a profile statement or objective statement. I'll go into why I don't care for objectives in a little bit. Um, and then it's about your career or your skills, depending on the type of resume that you use. So there's very specific things that have to be on a resume in order to just make it through the tracking system. Something to be aware of, you cannot have any creative deviance from a standard name, summary statement or objective, work experience, um, and then education. If the ATS system says anything to the extent of Upload as a .doc instead of .dox or .pdf instead of .pdfx because that means the system is a rather old system and it's not able to handle your resumes. So chronological resumes are utilized mostly with people who have a longevity in a field or who are looking at a field that really um, idolizes loyalty. That's going to be your healthcare, your behavioral sciences, things that require licenses, attorney's offices um, for, for attorneys. They want to see a chronological, reverse chronological order, really, of your work history. A functional or skills-based resume is something that looks at every skill that you've pulled from anywhere in your life instead of just your work experience or a hybrid, more commonly known as a combination resume, where it's a blend of both. The most commonly used resume in the US is the chronological combination, or excuse me, the hybrid or combination resume. You may um, have heard of the American style resume. That is the combination resume because employers love to see your skills, but they wanna see what skills you've used while working or in a work experience. Chronological resumes. All of these resumes have typos and mistakes because they are not real resumes. They were pulled from people who had submitted their resumes, except this one that just kind of gives an outline of what a resume is for. So I do apologize for errors. Um, I know I've had people point them out, so I do know they exist. The first thing that you want to see is on a resume, your name in bold, it's big, it appears on the screen quickly for a person to reflect on. An HR director who forgets your name at the bottom of your resume doesn't want to have to search for your name. So your, your name, the larger it is, the more likely they're going to reflect on it multiple times. And as they reflect on it, they're going to remember that name and it's going to be one that they say they want to interview. Next down in the sweet spot of the resume, the sweet spot of the resume is this section here. And can you see my mouse on the screen or do I need to drop? Find yes. it. Okay, so um, this here is the job title from the job description. So as long as you're using transferable skills and you're applying for something that you've been in similar in similar positions, then you can go ahead and put your job description title right here. It automatically instantly tailors that job to that resume or to that employer and the employer goes, wow, they tailored this for me. Then in 30 to 100 to 150 words, we're really seeing more of that 150 words now. Um, you want to use your opening branding statement that is on all of your social media, right? Because everybody has a branding statement. Even if you don't know it, you do have a branding statement that every employer you've ever had, they're going to have three or four words that they would describe you. If you don't have a brand statement right now or an elevator speech that you've already created, ask your employers, if you were to define me in three to five words, what would you define me? Or how would you define my strengths? Because then when references are called, that employer would say that same thing that you've already brand, branded yourself as. So that's, that's something to take into consideration when you're working with your clients. You wanna take the th top three to five asks from the job description and put them in this uh, summary profile statement area. Next on the chronological job description, I know these all say current employer, probably because somebody might've copied and pasted everything 
So I apologize. So this first, the current employer is the current or most recent employer. It is always in present tense. It is never in past tense. You want to make sure that you're using skills and traits that carry across from the job description. So if the job description is asking for something, you want to use their words, for example, created curriculum for 45 online students in second grade. That gives how many a quantitative value, but also uses the job descriptions ask that you be or able to create curriculum. You want to go ahead and have more bullets under your most recent job than any of the rest of your jobs. Even if you did some of the same things or they were exactly the same job and you just switched employers because you got a better pay rate at the next employer, you still want to make sure that the top job has the most bullets and really you should have the least on the bottom and then it grows as you grow, your career grows. So as your career grows, you're, you're adding to your resume. Regardless of the resume type that you choose, your resume should always have um, some form of volunteer work on it. Your volunteer work, 44% of all employers look at volunteer experience to determine whether or not they want to hire you. Why? Compassion is the main reason. Another reason is it shows that you have value in something other than just monetary reasons to work for them. And if you are committed to an area, you're committed, you're showing a loyalty to your community, which shows that you will likely show a loyalty to your team. So it's a benefit for them. And they know if you have volunteer work that you're likely going to do or be a really strong team player. And even if you have autonomous um, volunteer work that you're doing in a community, you still show that you're making a commitment to your team, even if you're that person who may be the one sitting in the background doing all the work, but not participating in creating some event. So that's something to keep in mind. The skills-based functional resume is more likely the resume that your students will use. This is one example. This person has their job title. Um, it should say DHS, Administrative Assistant. Uh, we removed that so that we kept the person um, person's identity to us. We, we didn't shift a lot on here because it was really great for showing the five top um, job description asks on a resume. The first thing I do wanna draw attention to is where it says a self-starter here. Ask anything off of a resume that says self-starter, organized, timely, because innovation, um, if you're not speaking to what it was that you did, employers don't care about those words. They're buzzwords indeed has several videos that they offer that tells you buzzwords for all industries and the best words for all industries. I highly recommend it. It's called smart something, but I can't remember, um, but it is indeed, indeed.com. Qualifications for uh, this particular resume goes here. This is skills, qualifications, whichever you want to title it is okay. This person chose to link every skill up in one area. WOMIS is a government system that is inter- um, interfacing for DHS, for Oregon Education, for Goodwill works with the Employment Department. So when an employer sees that from a government agency, which this application was DHS, and the ask was that the person have government or clinical work in their background, and that's if you look at this, it says works in a fast-paced environment, including government and clinical office. This person says, hey, I, I'm offering both of what you're asking for. I've done both. And in addition to that, this individual also has the WOMIS database system. Oh, I clicked it and it went for it. So that's something that's, that speaks to the HR director. As an HR person, you may never use, or HR talent scout, you may never use WOMIS, but you know it's something that the employer was working for. This person knows what it is. I wanna interview this person. Skills-based resumes never have anything under the experience for jobs ever um, because you're focusing on what the skills are that you draw from all over. Hackers, or computer technicians that didn't go to school and they learned it all on their own, they're going to use a skills-based resume. In fact, a lot of industries, industry giants in technology want to see the information that a person has learned in technology on their resume on a skills-based resume rather than a resume for a chronological or a combination because it'll tell everything that they have all over and they don't care where you learned it. If you could hack and change your grade in high school, then you can work in their system security and tell them where their security breaches. So that's another example. Military uses soft or excuse me, uses 
the skills resume because they can list everything that they've done in the military, not just things that they did in their standard job. This is another example. Um, for this one, I want to point out they, did, they didn't use the title of their job or we removed it. I don't know which one so that we didn't know who they were. They do have a job title over here. Their name goes to the side. It's, in my opinion, harder to see their, who they are for the HR director. So I do still recommend larger in the top um, or doing it here on the side and at the top is another way so that if the HR director reflects to either side or either area, they're going to have access to your name. But in the skills section, this person chose the top four skills, operations was one, and then they listed everything in their past that related to operations that also covered those beyond the top five asks. Customer service was another one. They did the same thing. And to the side, they put what their work experience was. And again, work experience doesn't have anything under it. It just says, hey, I work, these are the areas I've worked in my lifetime. And they may not relate to the job. Um, skills resumes are really for those who don't have a lot of transferable positions that, and they're applying for another job um, in a different industry. The year doesn't have to be there. You can remove the year if let's say you've had a short stint in employment or you've had a large gap and you can just put the number of years that you've been in a position. This is an example of a hybrid or combination resume. It's not my favorite, but it does have in a sweet spot, both the administrative specialist position as well as the core qualifications here. These are really important, these skills. This is everything the person brings to a job. This job was in an administrative office for a college. I don't remember exactly where this person had, um, had done a lot of troubleshooting and tech work in their past, but it wasn't part of their job or wasn't what they wanted to showcase for their job experience section. Then in their job experience section, they spoke to what they learned in those areas or what they used in those areas. Education, I wanna draw attention, none of these really showcase education, but any time you have a skills-based resume or a combination resume, you can take education from community, cer community certificates, um, you can use online education, you can use your college education, classes that you've taken minors that are directed towards the industry that you're looking at because it's not as um, experience-based as the chronological resume. So sometimes if you have a minor or if you have a class in something, it's okay to put it on these two types of resumes. Not so much with the chronological resume, just because those employers are looking more along the lines of what have you learned in your work experience. Typically those are just where you graduated from and what you graduated in and not dates. And we'll go over that in a minute. Okay. So you want to make sure that you're looking for your industry preferred resume, but just with being genuine in networking, you want to make sure you're genuine in what you want to use for a resume. It's okay to use a chronological resume if the typical field looks for skills-based and the same for a skills-based field using a combination or whatever. Why? You need to be able to show who you are genuinely. And if the employer feels that what you're writing down doesn't really fit you, they're not going to interview you. And even though we have different things on paper, there is a voice that we put in our resumes. And that voice is important because it tells the employer as much about you in a flat piece of paper as it possibly can. What you wanna include? You wanna include your contact information. This is where I'm going to tell you all about my name. So you want to include your name, your phone number, your professional email, which should never be your name and then your birth year or your birth date or any number that could be construed as your birth date or year because ageism bias comes into play here. So be careful with that. And it should never be anything like bigcats at gmail.com or pretty princess or anything like that. We've seen a lot of some, some way worse than that, but we, we, we've seen a lot of unprofessional emails. And even if you just, I recommend just having a job based email, use your name so that it's easy for the employer to find. And if you're somebody like John Smith, use John Smith 999 at gmail.com. Nobody's going to think you're 9,999 years old. Public profile. So 
your public profile should be linked on your resume. None of our resumes are up to date enough to show you that, but if you have LinkedIn's icon and Facebook icon and a Twitter icon on your resume, you can put the hyperlinks in and upload that as a PDF or a Word document and an employer can go directly to your social media. They're less likely to search for you, which means you're in control of what they're seeing online. Not only that, it directs them to the real you. I go by Kay Dunn um, for my work because there is a Natasha Dunn in the United Kingdom who is an adult film artist. There is a Natasha Dunn in Australia who is a lingerie model. And there is a Natasha Dunn here in the United States who writes romantic erotica. So I am none of those Natashas. Um, having K is an outlet for me so that I'm not taking credit for something that I haven't done, nor am I taking criticism for something that someone else has done. So being able to direct my employers to my social media is really imperative and my name is not considered a common name. So that's something to be aware of as well. City and state on a resume, if you don't need it, keep it off. If you're in a small community and you live in the community you're applying for, go ahead and use that city and state. If you don't use that city and state, then you're not going to be damaged in a job interview. But if you're from and you're applying in Newport, you are likely to cause a reaction in employers that are like, well, will they be able to handle the constant rain or will they want to be here when the sun doesn't shine in the summer? So that's something to consider when you're looking at, do I put city and state or not? There are very specific jobs that do require you to have city and state um, because they say you can only be 15 miles from a certain distance. If you're willing to move, you can leave that off and make sure that in your cover letter, you address that you are willing and able to, to move in the next two weeks and be in that location. Objective statements. Outside of my feeling of don't ever use one and unless you're an entry level student, objective statements take on a piece or take up space on a page and they don't tell an employer anything. They say to obtain a digital marketing position in an advertising industry, really good ones give the exact name of the employer they're applying for. However, a summary statement says, I have these things that you ask for in the job description. Are you interested in hiring me? Versus, hey, I really want to work for you. Which one are you going to going to hire? The one that says, hey, I can do these skills that you're asking for, or the one that says, please, please, please hire me? So it's more encouraging to see that summary statement. If you have a student who has never held a real job or this is the first entry-level career, then you can have the to obtain a digital marketing position in whatever the name of the company is so I can utilize or so I can utilize skills in such as and then list those skills that they have from the job description so that the employer knows they're entry level, they're eager to work, they've told me what they want and how they're going to help my company as well. That's about the only time I would use it unless you're applying to a very small rural community where it's traditional to have that objective statement. Summary of qualification should always include numeric quantitative values, such as increased sales as a sales manager. You don't necessarily have to say as a sales manager, but increased sales by 114% over a period of a single year. And if we're getting really close to time, go ahead and let me know and I will cruise through to the virtual workshop as well. Uh, so, we've got 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. Work independently as a night shift caregiver with zero incident reports. That tells the person um, if, if the job description asked for somebody who could work independently at nights as a caregiver, not only has this person worked at night, they've had five years with no incident report. So that's what we want to see. You want to make sure you have your job experience as well as volunteer experience, but only those that relate to the job, even with your job experience. If you have 10 years in the field, you don't need to list everything you've ever done. There are people who will list the entire kitchen sink and that's really your grandfather resume where you put everything in case there's a transferable skill you might need, but you don't wanna use that and let uh, that grandfather resume except to pull information from. So that has everything you've ever done. It's just a template for you to pull your information so you're not having to rewrite your resume from scratch every time. A tailored resume means that you're tailoring it to an employer. It doesn't mean that you have to rewrite something new. Volunteer experience. Use it on your resume. Um, you can put it on the side. You can put it at the bottom. Make sure you're using it. The only caveat to that is if you're volunteering in, say, NARL or Planned Parenthood or something that's um, NRA that's a hot button issue and you're applying to something that's probably on the opposite spectrum of the political scale, make sure that you don't have those listed as your volunteer work unless they're your only volunteer work. 
education is vital. You want to highlight your education. You want to make sure that you have community education where it's necessary. You, you, and again, for the ATS tracking systems, you want to make sure that you have whatever the job description asks for. Best practices are to present specific fonts. You always want to keep the font style and size the same, except where your name is. You can play with the fonts, but I would recommend, especially with people doing their first resume, they just increase the size and bold their name rather than play with any fonts because some fonts don't necessarily match together well. For margins, your margins should be one inch in if you're new and you have less things to showcase, and it should be 0.5 for those with more because it'll keep your resume to one page, two at most. If you do go on to two pages, you should have more than seven years of work experience and you should be able to fill the entire two space or two page space. You don't wanna have a gap because then it looks like you're only, you've only got part of a resume. So if you can't do two pages, then it's better to scale back than to try to stretch that two pages out. Okay, I've got a question. Um, what do you, um, from Francis, what, what would community involvement work along with or instead of volunteer experience? There are many community programs students get involved in. So I would break that with community service or have volunteer and community involvement as the title because then it's, it's going to cover everything. Community involvement is still volunteering your time to be part of a community. You're not getting paid to be part of that. And yes, you might be learning something, but you might be giving something back as well. So if you're, you're working, let's say I've been on the school board, I consider that my, my community service, um, but I still list it as a volunteer experience. So really it's up to you. It's what do you feel is best for it? If it's something like you're um, in a community book club or something, then have that involvement still. You never know if somebody has that hobby. Just um, an example, the Roseburg manager uh, for WorkSource chose his top candidate because he had two that were tied and he chose one because the person had indicated their um, interest in Star Trek over or on their resume as a hobby and how they were in a club, uh, a community club about Star Trek. So you never know what might be that little nugget that pushes you over for that culture or that environment because there are a lot of science geeks and nerds in the Roseburg office. Transferable skills. You want to make sure you're showing transferable skills. This is an example of a, a server who applied company policy interacting with returns and complaints. A manager usually takes on returns and complaints. This shows that that person can handle it even though they're not in that manager position. A targeted resume more applies with OSHA ANSI standards. So um, when working from terminal to a terminal operator to a park specialist. So having those certifications, the employer automatically knows that, hey, I don't have to pay for this person to practice for the tests. They already have these certifications. This goes to the ATS system. I'm going to go ahead and skip it. Just let you know. Highlights, the words are utilized from the job description directly onto the resume. You want to have showcase your hard skills, which are things like speaking French or Spanish fluently, and your soft skills, which are extremely adaptable and can work in slow and fast-paced environments. Your hard skills should cover two-thirds of the page. Unless you're in a human, human services field, then it's going to flip to one-third hard skills and two-thirds soft skills, or really you can go half and half because um, empathy and interpersonal communication and skills are really, really important when you're working in human service fields. Whereas business, it's more about can you, uh, or if you're an actuary, can you predict certain things in the financial future? So we want to make sure that you're um, matching your hard skills, soft skills to your industry as well. Some potential red flags in resumes are graduation dates. If you have them on your resume, wipe them out. If you're six months or more than six months from graduating, don't even mention that you're getting a degree until you're at that six month point. Then you put your graduation date in parentheses. Once you've accomplished that graduation date, you wanna take it off your resume and it's no longer an issue because that does cause age biasm again. Employment gap, if you want to work with your resume on employment gaps, go ahead and take dates off and rather than use dates, give the amount of time that you worked at a specific employer. If you have very short stints at work, don't even put dates or employment um, 
timeframes, just put the employer. It's okay to do that. HR directors are going to know that this is a red flag, but you've already taken the initiative to take that from the attention of the employer and they may breeze over it. Failure to follow directions. Cook, um, I'm sorry, Story Motion up in Portland does things like put, what's your favorite cookie in their job description? Place this in your education section of your resume or put it on your cover letter. Tell us, tell us what your favorite TV show is and why. They do things like that to make sure you're following the directions. More commonly, people don't follow the directions on naming their PDF, which is generally first name dot last name and name of job description. And they'll do something like last name dot first name and resume and send it in because they already saved it to their computer. They're just gonna click it, drag it, and put it in. They want to, you wanna make sure that they're following those directions. Spelling and punctuation errors are common. You'll see them even on our samples. Um, what is more common for resumes that irritate HR directors are bullet points that either have a period on some of their um, bullet points and no period on others. Choose if you're going to put a period, put a period. If not, don't. I recommend not because it's a bullet point isn't a full sentence. It typically doesn't have a pronoun in it or a proper noun. Um, so, uh, so you want to go ahead and eliminate your periods. If you're somebody who says, no, I want a period, then put, make sure you have a period at all um, spaces of your resume, all, all parts, and make sure that your bullet points are all the same size throughout your resume and they're all the bullet point that you chose to use. So if you're using a house as your bullet point, use a house throughout your entire resume. Don't go house, bullet, star, or diamond. It, it really distracts from your resume. Um, I've got a question, Kay. Yes. Um, how does one put self-employed um, at many companies? Um, I'm thinking substitute, but there are other jobs like courier um, that are similar. And then so also, because so many people are working, go ahead and answer, answer that when I'll ask. Okay, you. so um, if you're, if you're self-employed, let's say you're a U.S. Postal Service person and you are one of their contractors, you can put U.S. mail carrier. That's okay. That's what you are. Even if it's your personal business, you can list those and then you can give that you were self-employed and the person you reported to would be who you gave as a reference or as your supervisor. Because even if you're self-employed, the person who hires you or who uses your services becomes your supervisor. They're your customer. People who can have customers speak for them. It's just as important as having a, a boss speak to somebody who's a subordinate in some other form of industry. This is one that came up a lot. I know um, it comes up a lot in high schools. Would it be appropriate for a junior in high school to put an anticipated graduation date? For high school, mm -hmm. you, you can, but generally if you haven't completed graduation or your GED, you're not going to put that on your resume until you do. If you're a senior in high school and you, you know you're going to graduate, go ahead and do that. That's, that's something that you are, unless something like a strange pandemic overcomes your entire country and, and maybe the rest of the globe, you know for sure you're going to graduate because you've had a consistent pattern. Um, juniors sometimes will drop out and that's just part of high school. That's part of um, education and they're not necessarily the ones that are 2.0 and below. Some of them are 4.0s. So you want to still stick to that six month spectrum. And I would, I'm afraid I only have one minute left it looks like. So I have an entire extended piece on virtual um, virtual interviewing. So if, if you have interest in that, we do ha offer virtual interviewing on Fridays, every Friday in June from- uh, Do we wanna, I mean, if people wanna stay, I don't know, what do the rest of you think? If you wanna stay, what, another 10 minutes, Kay? I can probably do it in 10 minutes. Okay, if people wanna stay, we understand that, the, you know, that we've scheduled an hour. If you, um, it, um, if you want to stay, that's great. If not, click off and we will see you next Thursday for our hour and a half training, Summer Academy training. I timed this with no questions and no stories, so I probably should tack on an additional 10 minutes next time. I apologize, I really do. So this is virtual, a flavor of virtual interviewing. And why it's a flavor is we're not going to go into everything. And today it's really going to be just a, a little bit of a, a flavor. Virtual interviewers tend to look at platforms in asynchronous or live sessions. So what does that mean? 
It means that they are either pre-recorded or live, but it allows global perspective of candidates. It's, it is, um, is inexpensive, it's less time consuming, and it allows meeting when in-person meetings are impossible or not optimal like they are right now. So they're really becoming the hot button issue or hot, hot topic now. Skype, Adobe Connect, Microsoft Teams are all uh, live, whereas asynchronous are Spark Hire and Interview Stream. If you need examples of those, I'm happy to connect with you and show you how those work. And um, access to the best talent is given when you have a virtual interview because you can pull from anywhere in the world. It's a time saver, it's a cost saver. The interviewer doesn't have to travel, the interviewee doesn't have to set up rooms, snacks, or anything else. And it also tests the technology skills of an individual. You would prep the same way for an online interview as you would with follow-up as well as prepping for the interview. So you wanna make sure you send a thank you within 24 hours to that interviewer. Once you've done it, that's something that I may not have mentioned earlier. If somebody is interviewing, they do need to send a thank you because interviewers really, really want that. 100% of interviewers want a thank you letter. And then it's all over a range of, is that by email? Is that a personal letter or note? Is it both? It's all over the spectrum. It's about 25% split for those areas. You want to go ahead and practice um, your virtual interview in front of a phone or a camera. It's best to practice with another person so they can tell you what you look like on the screen. You want to make sure that you've always dressed the part for an interview. For a virtual interview, you're going to wear left right clothes. You don't want to have stripes. You don't want to have spots. And I'll go into that in just a second. Your space setting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do it this way. You want to make sure your lights are set. If you have one lamp, okay, that's great. It's better to have two lamps, one on each side. And it's best to either have a window facing you. If you have a window behind you, it's going to cause you to look like a shadow. But if you have a window in front of you, it offers really natural light. If you don't, then you can use this wonderful thing. I usually, for this workshop, don't even turn my light on until later, but my face, I can brighten or reduce the color with my ring. Um, and it's a selfie ring. They range anywhere from $15 to $100, depending on what you want to do. You can put a cell phone right in it. It's really great for youth because they're going to use that, um, that light system more than any of us. They're going to post online with it. It's, it's a great um, tool to have. Your background, you want to make sure is clean of clutter, but you also want it to represent something about yourself. If you are very creative, you're going to have a creative background. If you're like me, I love books, I collect things, so I chose this background from the online virtual backgrounds because I am very linear, but I also have a, a, a love of reading, and that's anything from fiction to um, quantum physics. I, I just love it. So somebody who's organ, organized, they want to have something that showcases that, and this is this is an example of that. You don't want this. It doesn't matter if this is facing the employer and they can see it in the background or it's facing you. If it's facing you, then you're constantly worried. Is there something that the employer is gonna see if I drop my phone, if I drop my computer? Note that the computer screen offers a much wider view. So even if a person is on their cell phone, what they see and what they test on their cell phone will not be what the employer sees. So the employer will see beyond the spectrum of their phone which is going to allow if somebody says, okay, I cleaned my space and really they didn't clean their space all the way, this is going to cause some issues because the employer will be like, well, yeah, that, that middle section is really nice, but look at all the sides and it will distract from the interview. You wanna go ahead and check everything twice. That's your mic, your phone, your monitor, whatever you're using. Your microphone should always be connected or paired with your computer the night before so that you know it's there. And if it's not working, then you can disconnect it and use your microphone from your computer. Microphones from computers are really great these days, but if you want to use an outside microphone, you want to make sure that it's five to six inches from your face. You want to have some form of lighting in your web camera. You want to make sure that it's about two inches from the monitor top or two inches from the or an inch and a half from your monitor bottom so that you've positioned it so it's looking straight at you rather than looking to where you look like you're leaned up or down. You can also set your cameras off to the side if you are someone who doesn't sit next to your computer, if you're spinning in your chair, because you want it to look like you're flush with the screen with your shoulders and your head in, in the space. You wanna test all of your equipment ahead of time. Um, this slide has a lot of information on, oops, I'm sorry. Huh. This slide has a lot of information on what to do with setup microphones and how to turn them on. Um, I will probably, let me scan, see what I, I'm cutting things, I'm so sorry. 
So something, some things that you want to do, you never want to take a bathroom break. I don't know if you've seen the Zoom bloopers on CNN that they're saying, don't be like this person. Here's some tips because you're virtual now. There are people sitting on the toilet that didn't know that their employer can turn that camera on. So you never want to wear just your underwear and dress just the top. You want to be fully professionally dressed because an employer often will ask you to get up and complete a task. You're also going to want to look directly into the camera lens so that you're not staring at someone. You all smile and change the fluctuation in your voice so that you're doing different tone shifts. You're sh changing the expressions the same way you would in person, but you may have to be extra enthusiastic for an interview that's online because it may not come across as well, but you don't want to be too enthusiastic to where people are like, that is like Pinkie Pie the Pony. I am not hearing her. So some things to consider. Things to dress in. In an online environment, it is not quite the same as in person. If you have something that's really bright, striped, or with spots or patterns on it, it's going to come across and it's going to move. And some employers and some people in the room will get sick from that movement. So you want to make sure you're not wearing anything other than a solid color. The color can be bright. It's better to use pastel colors. You never want to be on your bed. I never, ever, ever want to see anyone in their bedroom. <laughs> That doesn't mean that you can't be creative. If you are someone who's creative, don't forget you need to be genuine. You need to be you. The interviewer will know if you're talking about all your creative skills and you never mention how organized and um, timely you are and you have a clock and an organized desk behind you, they're gonna know that that's not the real you that you're presenting. So present a creative space that really works for you. Connect with a friend or better yet, a business and employment specialist at WorkSource Oregon because they can connect with you on Skype and really look and see whether or not your background works for the environment you're looking to interview in. So you want to make sure that when you're in an online virtual setting, you always introduce yourself to everyone in the room. You don't stare into your phone and work on other side things. You want to make sure that you're testing all your technology before the meeting. That includes your Wi-Fi, your microphone, everything. You want to read any of the pre-interview questions. That's something people don't tend to do. You want to answer those in writing while you're in the lobby so that you can reflect down if you can't remember because you're nervous on the page that you've written on. It's okay to look down and say, I have notes and let the employer know. If the employer is against notes, then just set them aside and do your best to remember. You also don't want to work on anything aside from the interview itself. So have pop-ups on for your email to come through or text messages on your phone. You want to turn those off and silence them because the employer can also hear the little dings. I'm sure many of you are hearing the dings while I'm in this workshop. If, if I had my emails on right now, you would also all be hearing my emails. So I turn those off and silence them for that reason. You want to make sure that you dress for the, to impress. Um, an interviewer can look at a person and tell whether or not they want to interview them and whether or not they trust them to work in their industry within 100 milliseconds. So that it is, it is very vital that you always have a smile. And instead of that firm handshake, your virtual handshake is going to be that smile that you give the employer and in your introduction. That's your 100 milliseconds of trust that you're offering is, can I trust you? Are you smiling and showing me that you're open and friendly? Some things that you wanna look for are pastels. You don't wanna wear really clunky jewelry that makes a lot of noise or that is noisy in terms of what it looks like on the screen. Pearls, however, for women uh, really resonate for some reason. Uh, even with politicians, you'll see politicians wearing pearls because people for some reason trust those pearls. In a virtual environment, we see a lot of people in t-shirts. Don't do t-shirts, don't do sweats. It's not okay in a virtual environment just as it wouldn't be in a regular interview. Always dress one to two stages above what you were considering dressing in. Uh, or what, what you would dress in for that position. So if somebody in that position is usually business casual, take that up just one more level, put that tie on with that button up shirt. Something to consider is if you are in an, a virtual environment and the employer may notice that maybe your haircut isn't done correctly, something you could say that would help with that, especially males who are, un are unable to go and get to the barber right now because we're in social distancing, this has been a frequent question with us. It may be a question with your clients as well. So I, can, I considered taking a creative, innovative approach to my haircut and using YouTube. However, that seemed a little risky, riskier than a pilot idea. So I decided that I would follow the stay at home order and that it was best to show up a little bit disheveled rather than risk getting sick or worse, getting someone who would be severely sick, sick or who would get severely sick, sick. 
I apologize for my lack of a haircut. That answer is can be funny if it's presented correctly. It can also show your compassion for other people as well as your willingness to take risks and analyze if the risk is something you want to take. So those are things that you can address in these situations. And I'm almost done, I promise. Virtual communication is something that we all do. Virtual communication is um, using your cell phone or your chats. You wanna make sure that you know how to use virtual communication. If somebody watches you walk into an actual interview, they're going to look at your facial expressions. Same thing with a, a virtual interview. If you're somebody who is dressing what's considered smart, which is a business attire, then they're going to see you as successful. If you make more eye contact, they're more likely to see you as intelligent. However, if you're somebody who wears a lot of makeup to an interview, they're going to assume that maybe you're trying too hard. Whereas if you wear no makeup to an interview, they're more likely to decide you're not trying hard enough or you're a workaholic and won't do anything else in your, in your life. So you won't be part of the team in socializing. These are just part of the things you really wanna focus on. Um, if you're going to show your piercings or your tattoos, if you have multiple piercings, or tattoos that can show that you're creative, but they tend to think that you're less intelligent. If you have tattoos, tattoos, it shows that you're more promiscuous and less reliable. And this is something that just our culture has developed into something that people have stereotyped and it is a bias that's in your um, job interviews. Platforms, I'm not gonna go over, but if you have any platforms that you want to utilize, go ahead and let me know. LinkedIn for your specific group of clientele, you, you should let them know that LinkedIn is piloting, it's brand new, a recording session where an artificial intelligence has taken answers from multiple HR directors that are the best sought answers for specific interview questions. So why do you want to work here is one of those interview questions. And the AI, grades how well you answer it based on all of these different HR numbers and tells you how great your interview was or what you need to work on. Are you talking too fast? Are you smiling enough? Are you answering with the words that HR directors have placed into that automatic tracking system of what they want to hear at that interview? So this is something that I would really, really encourage people using. Not only does it help you with any form of resume or excuse me, any form of interview, if you do have a spark hire interview where you have to pre-record an answer and send it back to an employer. This gives you an outlet to practice. Spark hire will tell you that the employer allows you to answer three times. What they don't tell you is if you mess up on one of those recordings, the employer still can view those recordings. So keep that in mind. With that, this is brought to you today by WorkSource Innovation and Opportunity Act. We have a lot of opportunities for scholarships, on-the-job training, occupational training, and pre-apprenticeship training. We also have additional workshops Monday through Friday in the month of June. If anybody's interested in those, just drop me an email and I am happy to set you up with those. Thank you so much for your time and I apologize for going over. That was awesome. Thank you so, so, so much. I mean, it just kind of blows my mind how things have changed so much. So really appreciate it. No problem. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. If somebody has questions that they need answered, or if you have a client that has a special interest or a question or something that they need to overcome, I worked with uh, six figure resumes and I, so I can, I can definitely help address those. Okay. Can I forward your contact info out to everybody? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks, Thanks so much, Kay. That was great. I went to a high school. I went to high school with a K Dunn, so there are others. Of <laughs> <laughs> yes, but none of them have as interesting as careers as those in the United Kingdom and Australia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I, <laughs> when I was running a campaign, somebody's like, "Hey, the campaign manager is this person," and I'm like, "No, that is not me. No, no. <laughs> I, I promise, that's not me." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Scary. Ugh. Awesome. Okay, we'll share your contact info out. Perfect. And see everybody next week. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. So cool. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, that was good. Thanks. Things are changing like crazy and and then you throw in the whole online stuff and all that. <laughs> wow. I was surprised to hear about the tattoo. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. And you know, you have to think that maybe you don't look something right. that way, but it's.